Our goal for this video is to prove the very classic result that E, in other words, Euler's constant, is an irrational number. Now, there are a bunch of proofs of this, but we're gonna prove it via a fairly simple method using a limit, which we'll get to later. But we're gonna use these following three tools. The first two are related pretty closely, and they are both kind of uh, similar limits. So we've got this limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of m from n plus 1 to infinity of n factorial over m factorial, that equals 0. And then the next tool is essentially the same limit, except we have an n multiplying out front. And then finally, the third tool, which we'll get to a little more carefully later, has to do with a limit of a sequence and a limit of a function. Okay, so let's start with this first tool, and we're going to prove this using the squeeze theorem. So let's start with the argument of this limit. So we've got this sum as m goes from n plus 1 to infinity of n factorial over m factorial. Now I want to rewrite that denominator carefully, and I'm going to do that in the following way. So I still have this sum. Now I have n factorial on the top, and then since all of these m's are bigger than or equal to n plus 1, I can rewrite it as follows. So I've got m times m minus 1 all the way down to n plus 2 times n plus 1 times n factorial. So now notice if we were to collapse all of these together, we would have a falling product starting at m, and that would in fact be m factorial in the denominator. So let's go ahead and point that out right here. I've just rewritten m factorial in that careful way. But now I can do a little bit of simplification. Notice I can take this m factorial and cancel it with this m factorial, and that's going to give me the following. So I have this sum as m goes from n plus 1 to infinity of 1 over, now I'm going to rewrite this as a ri rising power, so I have n plus 1 times n plus 2 all the way up to m. Great. So the next thing that I want to do is take this m that finishes off this product and rewrite it a little bit, so I want to write this as n plus m minus n. And I do that because I want every term in this product here to be n plus something. So we are, here we have n plus 1, here we have n plus 2, all the way up to n plus m minus n. So what we're doing is we're adding m minus n to n. Okay, good. Now the next thing that I want to do is notice that if I multiply out that entire denominator, I have a polynomial in n. And what's the degree of that polynomial? Well, notice that I have exactly m minus n terms. So I can write this as n to the m minus n plus more things. And those more things are positive just by the nature of how that multiplies out. So the next thing that I want to do is re-index this sum. So I'll let this m minus n equal k. And notice that means that k is going to start at 1 and go to infinity. And then I'll uh, get rid of that plus more stuff and introduce an inequality. So notice that this is going to be strictly less than the sum as k goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the k. Okay, so let's talk our way through that. So what we did is we took this polynomial in n and we took just the leading term, but if we take just the leading term, then that makes the denominator smaller, which makes the entire thing larger. Okay, but now look at this. We have a geometric series where the common ratio is one over n. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down here. This is a geometric series with common ratio 1 over n, and notice that the starting value is also 1 over n, given that here we have k equals 1 to infinity. So notice that we know exactly the formula for the sum of a geometric series, so I'll let you guys look that up if you need to, but it's going to be a over 1 minus r, so here we have 1 over n over 1 minus 1 over n, okay? But now let's go ahead and clear the denominators in this fraction. So we can do that by multiplying by n over n, and that's going to give us, this is 1 over n minus 1. So notice we've bound this thing above by 1 over n minus 1. Now the next thing that we want to notice is that we're summing only positive terms here. 
And since we're only summing positive terms here, that this thing necessarily has to be bigger than zero. Each term of this has to be bigger than zero. Okay, but now notice we've set up a squeeze theorem. So the argument of our limit is always between zero and one over n minus one. So now if we let n tend towards infinity, we see that this upper bound goes to zero, but the lower bound is already zero, which proves this first result. Okay, so we just built this inequality to prove this first limit, but now notice that it doesn't quite work to prove this second limit. We're gonna have to change this lower bound, but this lower bound is pretty simple to change. So let's go ahead and erase that. Now what we wanna notice is the very first term of this sum is equal to one over n plus one. So in other words, this is one over n plus one plus more stuff. And that more stuff is bigger than zero. So that's pretty easy to see because these are all positive numbers that we're adding up here. So that means that this um, sum that we're looking for is necessarily bigger than one over n plus one. But now we could have used this to prove our first limit via the squeeze theorem, but we didn't really need to. But this is essential to prove our second limit using the squeeze theorem. So what we'll do is take this inequality and multiply all parts of this inequality by n. And notice we get n over n plus 1 is less than n times the sum as m goes from n plus 1 up to infinity of n factorial over m factorial, which is less than n over n minus 1. But now it's clear that the lower bound and the upper bound both tend towards 1 as n goes to infinity. So let's go ahead and write that out. So this goes to one as n goes to infinity. And then this guy also goes to one as n goes to infinity, which that tells us by the squeeze theorem that our goal term also tends to one as n goes to infinity. So that means we've proven the second limit. Now for our third tool, we're gonna to prove this relationship between the limit of a sequence and the limit of a function. This is a standard exercise from real analysis, and we're gonna use the tools of real analysis. In other words, the precise definition of the limit of a sequence and the limit of a function. If you guys wanna know more about that, I'm in the process of building a playlist um, of a first course in real analysis for something that I'm teaching this fall, so check that out as I build it. So it says that if the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals a, and the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, then the limit as n goes to infinity of f of a n equals l. Okay, so let's get to this. So here we have the proof. So let's go ahead and suppose that epsilon is bigger than zero and it's some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero that we have been given. And now what we want to do is use this fact right here. In other words, the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l to find some delta bigger than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And we're able to do that because we know that this limit exists and is equal to L. And this is the precise definition of the limit of a function. Okay, great. So now the next thing that we wanna do is find some natural number, which we'll call capital N, such that if little n is bigger than capital N, we have the following, the absolute value of A n minus a is less than delta. Great. And so now we can do that because we've taken the delta from this first setup and put it inside the precise definition of the limit of a sequence. And we know that the limit of this sequence a n equals a. So that's why we can do that. Okay. So now what we want to notice um, is that if n is bigger than n, then absolute value of a n minus a is less than delta, which tells us that the absolute value of f evaluated at a n minus l is less than epsilon. Again, sort of just putting all of these parts together. But that's exactly the inequality that we needed to build to prove this limit. 
Now that we've got these three tools built, we're gonna derive a value for this following limit, which we can use to prove that E is irrational. The limit that we're looking for is the limit as N goes to infinity of N times sine of two pi E N factorial. Okay, so the first thing that I'll do is take this E and expand it as its infinite series. So this is gonna be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of n times sine 2 pi, and now we have this sum as m goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over m factorial times n factorial. But I'll go ahead and take that n factorial and put it in the numerator right here. Great. Now the next thing that I want to do is take this sum and break it into its integer part and then its fractional part. And I can do that in the following way. So notice that all of the parts where m is between 0 and n are integers, because here we have the numerator is larger than the denominator, and they're both factorial, so that both simplifies. So that means I can write this as the sum as m goes from 0 to n of n factorial over m factorial. And I wanna call this maybe zn, and notice that that is an integer. It's actually a positive integer, but all we really need is that it is an integer. And then to that, we'll add the rest of it. So that's gonna be the sum as m goes from n plus one up to infinity of n factorial over m factorial. Good. Now what I wanna do is notice that this is equal to something which we'll call a n, and this is the fractional part. So we're not actually gonna prove that it's not an integer, but what we will notice is that it's exactly equal to this term right here, which approaches zero. So it's definitely less than one at some point. Okay, great. So now I wanna rewrite my limit using those things which I've just defined. So I'm gonna write this as n times the sine of two pi zn plus two pi a sub n. Good. And now what I wanna notice is that because of the periodicity of sine, sine is two pi periodic, that means I can get rid of this term right here and I have the same value. In other words, if I add an integer multiple of two pi into the argument of sine, it doesn't change the value. Okay, so now I'm kind of easing on to a pretty common limit from calculus one. Notice here we have two pi times a sub n. So now what I wanna do is change this limit a little bit so that I achieve this two pi times a sub n in some other places. So what I'll do is I'll multiply it out here, two pi times a sub n, and then I'll divide it here, two pi times a sub n. Good. Now the next thing that I wanna do is split this into two limits. So this is gonna be the limit as n goes to infinity of two pi times n times a sub n times the limit as n goes to infinity of the sine of two pi a sub n over two pi a sub n. And notice that I'm allowed to do this because both of these limits exist. This first limit exists because it's exactly equal to this second tool multiplied by two pi. So that means I can exchange this for two pi. And then this first limit exists because this is exactly equal to the limit as x goes to zero of sine of x over x. If we just do kind of a change of variables for the continuous variable x and our sequence a sub n using this third tool here, and we know that this limit is equal to one. So I've got this first limit is two pi, the second limit is equal to one, which makes this whole thing equal to two pi. Okay, good. 
So now that we've got this limit in hand, it's actually fairly quick to show that E is irrational. So let's go ahead and clean up the board and do that. Okay, so we just got done proving this complementary limit that will help us prove that E is irrational. So we just proved that the limit is N goes to infinity of N times sine of two pi E N factorial is equal to two pi. Now, like I said, we're gonna use that to prove that E is irrational and we're gonna do that by way of contradiction. So in other words, we want to suppose that E is a rational number and then show that that will contradict something that we've built. In fact, it will contradict the value of this limit. And so that means that we can write E as P over Q with P being some integer and Q being some natural number. And notice that we can actually take them both to be natural numbers if this is a rational number because we know that E is positive. And furthermore, if we wanted to, we could take these to have GCD of one. That's pretty easy to see. Now, the next thing that we want to notice is that if N is bigger than Q, we have the following setup, which is problematic. So we have E times N factorial. So that's gonna be equal to P over Q times N factorial. Now using the fact that N is bigger than Q, I wanna expand N factorial. So here we have, this is P over Q. And then we, here we have N times N minus one all the way down to Q plus one times Q times Q minus one all the way down to two times one. So we know that Q is somewhere in there given the fact that N is bigger than Q. But notice we can do some sort of simplification here. We can cancel this Q with this Q. And now we've got just a big product of natural numbers. So we know that this is equal to some natural number. Good. But now notice that that tells us that sine of two pi times E times N factorial is equal to sine of two pi times some natural number. So let's maybe go ahead and call this natural number Zn like we did before. So this is times Zn, where again, that is some natural number. But we know that sine of any integer multiple of two pi is equal to zero. Great. So let's read this from the top to the bottom. For n bigger than q, we have sine of two pi e times n factorial is equal to zero. That means this sine function is equal to zero after some point all of the time. But from that, it follows that the limit as n goes to infinity of n times sine 2 pi e n factorial must itself be equal to zero, but that contradicted this original fact that we just proved. So we've contradicted this limit, but that means that e cannot be a rational number. So in other words, e is irrational. And that's a good place to stop.